John MacArthur, who is a mentor and a friend of Steve Lawson, recently just came out and kind of spoke about it. And he said some things that I think are pretty interesting. So I want to go ahead and take a listen to that because I think there's some parts that I think is worthwhile us hearing. But sometimes, unexpectedly, there are threats and challenges. There's adversity that comes from inside the church when people that we respect and trust turn out to be different than we thought they were, or at least than they profess to be. When that happens, we're all stunned. How do we process that? How do we move past that? Well, I know you're talking about Steve Lawson. Um, and I, I say that with the deepest agony in my soul. Um, but the first thing you have to understand is God is blessing this church in many, many ways. And that is one of the ways he is blessing us. God is blessing the church by exposing it. Well, the reason why that's a good thing is, one, because people need to know that God does not tolerate sin, especially those that are in leadership. And so there's a, there's a passage that speaks about rebuking an elder in front of those. There's, a, there's an open rebuke so that those who are watching can see that this will not be tolerated. So it's a good thing to know that these things should not be, and the person that's in charge, the person that's leading, the pastor, whomever, you don't get away with it. You don't get a pass. To expose someone who is in a position they have no right to be in. To purify the church. To purify the church. I mean, this is the whole point of Revelation 2 and 3, right? Where the Lord sends all those letters to the churches and says, look, something isn't right. Now, what he's speaking of, and I'll let, I'll let the video play even more so, but this comes up because people think that this particular passage is speaking about someone possibly losing their, losing their salvation. Let's go to this passage in Revelation 2, uh, starting in, let's start in verse 1. Uh, to the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. Now, the key is understanding what are the lampstands. The lampstands are actually the church, so the local congregation. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and I have not grown and I'm sorry and have not grown weary but I have this against you that you have left your first love therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, this you do have that you hate the deeds of Nicolaitans. Now, let's just pause for a second. He's speaking about, okay, you've got good doctrine. You hold um, things uh, properly. You view things properly. You don't tolerate certain things or certain heresies and so forth. That part is good, but you have left your first love and remember how it was when you first started at your first. And sometimes it's good, you know, as, as believers to think about how you were when you first started off, especially those who are in leadership, how you were when you first started off, the love that you had, the devotion that you had to him. And so it's easy sometimes, I shouldn't say easy, but it can happen to where you can get off the beaten track. You can forget about yourself guarding your own heart. You're guarding the doctrine. You're guarding the the church, you're guarding the doors, you're guarding the walls, but you're not guarding yourself inwardly. And that's the point he says, or else I will remove your lamps. And that is that that particular church will cease to exist. So what he's saying is, if you don't get this straight, if you don't get this correct, well, then the church itself, not your salvation or the individual people, but the body will cease to exist. By the way, there are many churches now that just simply don't exist. Some churches get old. Every church, even a church that starts off right and godly there there usually is an end to that particular church for some good reason or some bad reason but oftentimes though churches aren't churches aren't eternal now the people inside them their lives can be but the church itself is not in your church you either deal with it or i'm coming i'm going to blow the candle out and you're going to be out of existence i mean the church has two options one get right two you're done i mean the church of Laodicea was done. Smyrna was done. Um, you, either, you either deal with the sin. One of those letters basically says you have someone there who tolerates adultery. I'll remove the candlestick. It is fatal to a church to have that kind of behavior in leadership. 
And while none of us knew it or expected it, because of the soundness of the theology, the Lord knew. And the Lord said, for Grace Church, that's enough. For the Master Seminary, that's enough. Um, I think there's a, there has to be a weariness with the Lord. I think He has to be sick of superficial church worship. One of the downsides of not being here every Sunday morning is the agony of watching church on TV and the frivolity and silliness and superficiality. Um, the, the, the pragmatic movement, we all talk about pragmatism over the last 30, 40 years. Church is becoming pragmatic, trying to entertain unbelievers. I think there's a weariness with God with that. And some of those pragmatic um, churches, the, the ones that maybe had the greatest amount of influence, like Hillsong or um, the one in Dallas, or Robert Morris's church, which is right across the road from Tom Pennington's faithful church, Countryside Bible, the, the, the Lord is turning the spotlight on and um, saying, that's enough. That's enough. And unfaithful leaders are being exposed as they should be. And while we would wish that it had never happened to us, we would be foolish to think that there wouldn't be an effort made by the enemy to plant in this church someone who could have a corrupting influence while apparently having a positive influence. That's the subtlety of Satan. And it almost seems to me that you'd have to have somebody like that here because we wouldn't take well, the, the kind of leadership that other churches take to, to rise to this pulpit your theology has to be sound and everything about you as far as we know it to be supporting that theology so if we were going to have that that's the kind of person it would be but, I, I, but again I, you know as we get closer to the end I think the Lord is purifying his church and I, I'm so thankful for that my heart and soul aches for Steve, obviously, a uh, friend. I don't love him any less than I've loved him for 25 years. I, um, I, I don't know how you preach past your conscience unless it's completely scarred over. Well, let me answer that. It's easy to do so if you become complacent. It's easy to know the truth and sometimes not apply it to yourself. Now, I don't know all the particulars, uh, the conversations that were going on, the the inappropriate discussions. Don't know. I, I can't speak on that, but apparently it was enough. It rose to uh, enough of egregious nature to where the church decided, hey, you've got to, you've got to stop. You've got to say you, you are no longer with us anymore. <laughs> and so it's easy how this happens is, while again, you focus so much on doctrine that you forget about what's happening internally. And so it's easy to get further removed, which is remember, this is why, by the way, the Bible speaks about. Matter of fact, let's go to this, this passage in First Timothy three, where he says that the person must be able to manage his own home. He says that. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Well, that speaks to the ability for him to deal with what's happening internally at his house. Is it going to be perfect? No. But certainly what's happening in his house also refers to him and his wife. And that means someone else on the outside coming in. And so you've got to protect that. You have to always be on guard for those particular things. And if not, what happens is, one, you give an, an, the enemy or those who hate God an occasion to come against. And that's what happened with Paul. Nathan is, I mean, Paul, with David. Nathan is talking to David in First Samuel after his uh, what he did with Bathsheba. Now, remember, David's already married, and then also Bathsheba has a husband as well. And he says, however, verse 14, because you have done this deed, you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born to you shall surely die. And so there's consequences, but also the reason why there's consequences is because of what you're doing, tarnishing the name of the Lord. And that's vitally important to him. Uh, but I, I pray constantly, in fact, find myself almost every night praying for him in some point in the middle of the night. So, um, but the Lord has favored us. He wants a pure church. I mean, the, the first instruction in the Bible for the church is if somebody sins, go to him, right? Matthew 18. And ultimately, if they don't repent, tell the church. Tell the church. Paul said, I want to present to the Lord a pure and chaste bride. Sometimes we know the sin and we can deal with it. Sometimes we don't know 
the sin, and the Lord has to bring it out. But while my heart is crushed for the sinner, it is grateful for the Savior who is purifying his church. Along with that emphasis on purity, I know with our pastoral leadership team over the last several weeks, you've really been emphasizing the priority of unity. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask you, when you think about Grace Community Church and what it means to be unified in Christ, why is that such an important priority and how can we as members of this church pursue that biblical calling? Well, of course, we all heard this morning in John 17 that there is a, there is a spiritually organic unity. We're all one in Christ, right? And that ought to play out in how we live our lives. Um, just coming off that incident we were just talking about, when a church is so severely wounded, uh, it's like an animal. When that animal is severely wounded, all the predators will move in for the kill. And what I noticed online was this, as soon as this thing was exposed, those people who resent and hate and attack Grace Church all the time ramped up their attacks. And they started coming after us. And you can't let that happen. This is why the Bible is clear going back to 1 Timothy 3. Notice what he says in dealing with the qualities of a leader, a pastor. He says, and he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the, the snare of the devil. People on the outside, it's important how they see you on the inside. Why? Because you want people on the outside to become part of what's happening on the inside. You want the outside people to become part of the body. And if they don't respect you, if they see you in sin, if they think that you're doing something wrong, well, then they're, therein lies a problem. And how do you bring in people? How do you shepherd people who do not like the, the, the local shepherd? That's a pretty hard trick to do. Uh, so you were there, right, in my house. Mm-hmm. We got together for two or three hours, and we said, this is where we take our stand. This is where we love each other. We support each other. We uphold each other. We um, deal honestly with each other as leaders. Uh, we, we've got to circle the wagons. We've got to link our arms. We've got to make sure the chain is unbroken because when we're exposed like that, all the enemies are going to come at us with a vengeance. And if they can pit us against each other, they can do some real damage. Um, and I said, the, the damage is done. No more. We're going to be faithful to each other and faithful to Christ in our loving of each other. Um, none of us is perfect. We, we all have to concede, right? Something, sometimes a lot of things. I guess particularly to me, but the Lord wants us to be unified. I love this, in the perfect bond of peace, peace with each other, the perfect bond of love. So we've got to find a way to close ranks and not let the wound be an opening for enemies to attack our integrity or to pump lies about us out onto the internet. We've got to be faithful to each other. So I thought that was interesting. One, people have been waiting to hear what he would say, and so he makes a statement. So I thought it was interesting uh, and pretty, and actually good to hear from him. Uh, there is no such thing as a perfect church. All the leaders inside that church, inside a Grace Community Church, inside my church, inside your church, any other church, they are flawed. They've got issues. They've got sins they deal with. And now what we also need to make sure that we are also careful and also being fair when we deal with other sins. Again, I said this before, we'll call out someone in some sort of uh, affair or something like that or whatever. What about the guy who is um, mismanaging funds, his funds as well? What about the guy, the, the pastor who's a jerk? What about the pastor who is not hospital? What about the pastor who's a bully, who is not temperate? What about those things? We don't tend to call those things out and say he's got to be removed, but those are just as egregious Those are part of the qualifications that God, that Paul brings up in 1 Timothy 3. And so we need to be honest and fair across the board. But again, it's just good to hear uh, someone close to him. Folks have been waiting to hear what he had to say. And so now we have it. But let's, again, let's make sure that we apply this towards every particular sin. And let's make sure that not only we hold the leaders accountable, but also hold ourselves accountable as well. Amen. (laughs) 